One common misperception that we as a people have when it comes to the revolutionary time period in American life is that everybody was on the same page and everybody knew what kind of government uh, we wanted in the aftermath of the revolution. Everybody knew what the government would look like and how it would function after the uh, British had been defeated. Nothing could be further from the truth. And there is an enormous amount of diversity of thought, as you're going to see. Uh, there were some people that felt, uh, you know, everybody ought to be voting. There, there should be uh, one vote per, per, per citizen. And there were other people that were very, very skeptical of that. And that's certainly something that we need to explore. Um, I want to begin our conversation with the, the term republicanism. Now, we didn't oftentimes agree on what the government ought to or ought not to be doing, but if there's one word that united us as a people in the aftermath of the revolution, it was republicanism. Now, I mean this with a small r, republicanism, even though if you're following along in the PowerPoint, it's got a big r next to it. I don't mean like the grand old party, Abraham Lincoln, um, uh, John, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, somebody like that. I mean the concept of uh, republicanism, the idea that we would have a form of government that was not inherited. That's what I mean by republicanism, a form of government that was not a monarchy. It was a going to be a system of government where uh, it would not be passed on from one generation to the next. Now, even those individuals that were believers in the concept of republicanism, there's, again, quite a lot of diversity of thought. You're looking at one individual that, shall we say, might have been a bit of a dissenter. That's John Adams. And as you're going to find out, John Adams was a really, really brilliant founding father, a very great political thinker, and uh, not so great of a president, as we'll find out. But John Adams is what I like to call a conservative Republican. Now, I don't mean like he wants to cut taxes or uh, limit government or anything like that. What I mean is conservative in the sense that he feels not everybody ought to be voting. Um, people that don't have any land, uh, they're probably not very good candidates to vote. Uh, people that don't have a lot of education can't read and write. Uh, they're probably not very good candidates to vote. John Adams felt that the only people that ought to be voting were people like him, people that were very well read on the issues, very well educated, owned land, had money. That way they had some skin in the game, so to speak. Uh, if we're going to raise taxes on property owners, it's real easy to raise those taxes if you don't happen to own any property. But when you do, that's a completely different subject. But in any case, John Adams is a guy that believes not everybody ought to be voting. There should be a select group of people uh, that should be the voters. He makes this very well known in his, uh, in his pamphlet that comes to be known as Thoughts on Government in 1776. But if you're looking for an example here in terms of what John Adams really, really amounts to, um, I mean a conservative approach to government. I mean a conservative approach to who's participating in the process of government. One individual that couldn't have disagreed anymore if she tried was none other than his wife, Abigail Adams. Now, historians view both John and Abigail Adams both as intellectuals. They were both very well-learned people. And um, right in the aftermath of the revolution, George Washington was elected president. And back in those days, they didn't have vice presidents that they ran with. It was just whoever came in second, that individual would be the vice president. Well, John Adams came in second. And when he left from Boston uh, to go to what was the capital at the time, New York, um, his wife told him, don't forget about the ladies. Um, the ladies should have the right to vote as well. Uh, ladies need to be a part of this democratic process. And John Adams just thought that that was a ludicrous idea, uh, did not think that women had the capacity, most women anyway, had the capacity to vote. In a way, he's very much a man of his times, and um, he said this would not be tolerated. And uh, um, Abigail Adams came back with, well, if, if the men don't uh, uh, provide a voice for the ladies, there would be trouble on the home front. 
And John Adams comes back and said if there was trouble on the home front, the men wouldn't stand for this. And this kind of bickering went back and forth. But my point in telling you about Abigail Adams, in addition to kind of muddying the waters and getting you to get the idea that not everyone's on the same page in terms of who should be participating in government, let alone what the government ought to look like, is that um, there, there's, there's a disagreements even within the context of households, and the Adams do provide you know, a good example when it comes to that. Uh, there's a woman from Massachusetts by the name of Judith Sargent Murray that kind of stands this idea of women participating in voting, stands it on its head. And what she does is she cautions the lady. She says, listen, um, the men have it right. We should not be voting. Um, we're not ready to vote. Uh, before we can really participate in democracy, we, we need to be able to read and write. Before we can do that, we need to be sent to school. Now, public education had had a long history in New England as a region, but for the most part, it was the men that were sent to school and the ladies were not. And so what she's doing here is she's kind of using this argument as a backdoor method to get into public education. And she's proclaiming that women and girls ought to be sent to school. And ultimately what you do is you see a lot of women uh, that are being sent to public schools. And as a consequence, literacy, at least in the New England region, would, would soar as a result of all of this. So even these things that are not overtly political, um, they have some loose connection and affiliation to the political at this particular time. Now, really good explanation in terms of how we're all over the map as far as political orientations and our thoughts on governments would be the Articles of Confederation. Um, the Articles of Confederation almost killed the United States before there even was a United States. Let me explain. During the American Revolution, everybody knew what we did not want. We did not want to be the British. Once we were on our own and we had our independence, we didn't want to do to the American people what the British were doing to the colonists. We didn't want to do that. You can understand their thoughts. Um, they had been living under uh, what they viewed to be a tyrannical government for at least the last dozen years or so. Uh, they were fighting, at present, they were fighting against a big centralized power. And so what the Articles of Confederation did, and this is worth writing down, is it established a very weak central government, weak central government. Under the Articles of Confederation, the state government would be a lot more powerful and a lot more relevant than the federal, central, national government would be. The idea here is to decentralize power so that you don't make the same mistakes that we felt that the British had made with us. If you make Virginians, for example, uh, more important, more relevant, more powerful as a form of government, as opposed to the federal government, uh, because Virginia knows you much, much better than those people in a distant land, um, that government would be far more reflective and far more responsive to your needs as Virginians. So what I want you to understand about the Articles of Confederation is that in setting up a weak central government, it really only gives the federal government the power to do things like raise armies. It gives the federal government the, thing, the power to do things like um, make treaties in between uh, the United States and other nations gives the federal government to make new states into full-fledged, fully participating states. But there's a few really important things that there that you did not hear me mention. Number one, it did not give the federal government the, the power to tax people directly. Think about this for a minute. What good is an army if you can't put guns in their hands and bullets in those guns? If you can't afford to raise an army, then what good is the army? If you can't tax, you can't raise armies. Um, the other thing you did not hear me say, uh, say was the fact that it doesn't give the federal government the right to regulate external trade. And so what we've got are 13 different trade policies. Uh, what may have been taxed um, in, in Massachusetts, uh, textiles from Britain, from it, for example, there's, there's a tax on them. They very well might not have been taxed in South Carolina. 
um, each state could and did pursue its own economic policies, which made us a mess in terms of an economy. Lastly, you did not hear me say that the federal government would get the final say when it comes to resolving differences and arguments in between states. So if you had a border dispute, um, both states claimed one city, for example, um, many times these, these disputes, these arguments could rage on for weeks and sometimes even longer than that. The federal government simply did not have any say. To put it another way, the Articles of Confederation were successful to a point, uh, to, to a fault rather. Um, they, they, they did set up a weak central government, a weak central government that proved to be a liability in the, in the big picture. Let me explain what I mean. Having a big central government has never really been a popular concept. I mean, I don't know about you, but I never feel really, really great when I sign a, a check to the IRS and pay my income taxes. That, that, that never puts me in a really great mood. But, you know, I, I do like having things like a, a, um, like, a, like a military to defend us. Um, I like having agencies that the government uh, organizes that make sure that uh, the food that I eat or the air that I breathe is safe. Um, so every once in a while, it makes a, an awful lot of sense to have a, a government that's capable of organizing a society. They, meaning the American uh, uh, people in early American history, got, got a very good example of why every so often it makes a lot of sense to have a strong federal government. In 1787, in, in an event in Massachusetts that's known as Shays' Rebellion, Daniel Shays was an, an, an officer in the colonial army. He was from Massachusetts, and he was very bitter in the aftermath of the war because the government just never paid him for his services. Um, that was a rub, but what was even more embittering is a... Um, a faraway government, uh, had the audacity to tax him. And by faraway government, I mean in Boston. He's in, he's in Western Massachusetts. This faraway government is, is all the way in Boston, so goodness knows what he must think of the federal government. That's like in a different universe or something. Anyway, what Daniel Shays does to display his discontent is he gets together with um, other embittered individuals like himself, and they go on a rioting spree. And, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to rage on for weeks here. As a matter of fact, Massachusetts uh, is going to be forced to put down the rebellion in and of itself. Um, and it's going to take them weeks to do it. It'll, it'll, it'll rage on in the following year, as a matter of fact. Now, think about that for a minute. If we had a situation that even came close to that, what the governor would probably do is call in the National Guard. Um, in other words, uh, every once in a while... It makes an awful lot of sense to have a strong central government. Uh, you're stronger as a group of people when you've got a stronger national government. And Shays' Rebellion demonstrated that a stronger federal government would have been able to deal with that situation much more effectively than what happened in Massachusetts. But the one maybe silver lining that the Articles of Confederation actually did give to the federal government is going to come in the West. Now, if you were with us the last time, you heard me say that one of the things that the British did to get us to sign quickly for peace in the revolution is they threw in all that land west of the Appalachian Mountains. That was the land that we had our eye on for a long, long time. It was one of the reasons that we agreed to fight in the French-Indian War in the first place. Because the Articles of Confederation gave the federal government the power to organize new states, uh, the federal government had the right to sell that land in the, uh, the Old West um, to organize into future states, first territories and eventually states. And so what it does is it begins to sell that land, and it sells it very, very uh, cheaply. If you're looking at the PowerPoint and the, uh, the image in the top right corner, uh, the future states of Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi, um, that land was going for as little as $1 per acre. Now, the government didn't nickel and dime. You had to buy a big bulk of land. But at the same time, that was still a very, very good deal, um, considering it was valuable farmland. 
So my point in this is that the, the ability to sell that land and organize those territories and estates, that is giving the federal government a little bit of discretion when it comes to raising money. Not very much, but a little bit's better than none. The other area that it's trying to organize into states would be what was known as the Old Northwest. Now, by Old Northwest, I mean the future states of Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, what you traditionally think of as the Midwest. In any case, um, the same thing that it's doing in, in, in the South, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, it's doing in the, in the Old Northwest. It's selling that land, and it's selling it cheaply, but with a special catch. Because it's the federal government that is in charge of organizing those territories, the federal government can make provisions on what those territories must do. What the Northwest Ordinance does is it, it makes two provisions for those states in the old Northwest for getting into the country and becoming full-fledged states. The first provision is you have to have 60,000 people. Once you have 60,000 people in the territory that's coming to be known as Ohio, for example, Ohio can petition the federal government and it can, uh, it can apply for statehood. Now, before Ohio can become a state, however, not only does it have to have 60,000 people, it also has to draft a constitution that makes slavery illegal within its boundaries. For your notes, what the Northwest Ordinance does is it forbids slavery in any form and fashion in the Old Northwest, in what would become Ohio, in what would become Michigan, in what would become Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Ever since those states were states, slavery was illegal there. Now, why am I making such a big deal about this? Well, on the one hand, um, this is a very weak federal government that's doing this. It's kind of ironic that the Articles of Confederation didn't give the federal government the power to tax people, but it does give the federal government to tell people in these new territories where slavery is and is not legal. Um, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. I'm just simply saying that it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It seems like more power over here and less power over there. But even more importantly, you're going to see this again and again and again. The federal government in 1820 will say, for example, that slavery is okay in Missouri, not okay in Maine. Uh, years later, the federal government will say there will be no slavery in California. My point is that for the better part of 80 years, it had been the federal government that was telling people where slavery was okay and where it was not okay. Now, the reason that that is important is because in a lot of ways, that's really what's bringing about the Civil War. Um, where can slavery go? And more importantly, who has the right and the power to say where it can and cannot go? Well, if you've been following along with us ever since 1887, uh, excuse me, 1787, and the passing of the Northwest Territory, uh, the Northwest Ordinance, it's been the federal government that's been saying this. And as we inch closer and closer to 1860, there, there will be people that begin to challenge that power and that authority. You'll see what I mean later on in the semester, but for right now, um, we're going to transition into, into the, the, um, uh, the realization that uh, there, we need to fix the Articles of Confederation. Um, by the late 1780s, um, there's a core group of people that have come to the realization that the Articles of Confederation, while they sound very good on paper, are, are not very good when we put them into practice. And this core group of people are going to consist of Thomas Jefferson, uh, James Madison, George Washington, John Adams, and this group is going to come to be known as the Nationalist Faction. And that is where we will begin our conversation when I meet with you the next time.